So our focus is verse 17, just one verse for today. But coming in from this, last week as we saw, verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In our previous sermon, we studied the doctrine of adoption, the reality that for anyone who has believed in Jesus Christ, namely his death and his resurrection, for those who have believed, they have been justified by faith, but they have not just simply become in right standing and forgiven by God, they are now a part of his eternal family. They are now family members as children of God. This is just amazing to think of, right? That the mighty Yahweh of eternity would bring human beings into his own family. And so therefore there is now a closeness with God as our Heavenly Father. And this offers to us incredible assurance as believers. We belong to him. Not only does it give, give us assurance, it actually transforms our behavior as Christians. It spurs us on in obedience, knowing who our Father is. We have a whole new identity. We are children of God and He is our Father. Paul goes from this now to the implications, or what does it mean to be a child of God? He goes on to now teach us about the, the benefits, if you like, of being a child of God, which is our focus today, verse 7. Where, and he says, if we are children, then heirs. We are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This phrase, heirs with Christ, is so rich in meaning. And it gives us an opportunity here, first of all, to do something that we should always do when it comes to reading the Bible or studying scripture. See, in the modern context of, of, of churches and evangelicalism, it is very often that people will grab the Bible, open it, and try to see themselves in the Scriptures first and foremost. Uh, uh, we remember times, and we've probably all done it ourselves, where we, we just want a word from the Lord, and we flip the Bible open, and hopefully God's going to say something to us. All right? It's not wrong to do this. God's Word is living, it, and, he, and He speaks to us. But if we come to the Bible with the idea that I want to see what God says about me, we miss firstly that the Bible is about God and he will teach us about himself. Amen. And you are going to be a happier Christian if you understand who your God is that you're worshipping and following. Rather than coming to the Bible and everything being about you, firstly, the Bible is about God. His mission, his kingdom, his creation, and his future plans for humanity and for this world. So whenever we read scripture... A simple question that we can ask is, what does this teach me about God firstly? What does it teach me about Christ, my King? What does it teach me about the good news of the gospel? So good Bible reading and study. For you in the week, for us when we preach, when we get together and study God's word, is to come and see what God says about himself firstly. And what we learn here is that we are heirs with Christ. Which means that before we get to talking about us, it is Christ himself who is the heir. He is the one who is first and foremost the heir. Firstly, let's just say, what is, a, what is an heir? In general terms, an heir is someone who inherits property through the death of another. Someone who has an inheritance. They, they're an heir. They receive something upon the death of another. Uh, the Baker Bible Encyclopedia defines an heir as one who inherits something... Or who is entitled to a future inheritance. In the Old Testament, the firstborn child is the emphasis for being the heir. The firstborn son was entitled to a double share of the inheritance upon the death of the parent. And it's worth noting then that often when we're reading in the New Testament about sonship, about sons, it's referring to all Christians having then... This position of receiving from Christ, being the heirs, is where we're going to get to. But first, Jesus is the heir, the firstborn. Not the firstborn as though he were a created being. Christ is eternal. He's the eternal God of creation. But he holds the title of firstborn as the heir, as the preeminent one, the most important in all of existence. He holds the title of son. He holds the rights the inheritance of the firstborn son. I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning a little bit with me. We're going to go 
towards the end of our Bible to the book of Hebrews. If you get to James, you've gone too far. Hebrews, and we're going to go chapter 1. Why are we going here? We're looking at Christ being the one who inherits. Christ being the heir. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 say, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Let me read verse 2 again. In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. So this is an important phrase for us here, that Christ is the heir of all things. How much power does Jesus have? How much authority? Is there a a bit of a, a portion of creation that Jesus will inherit? No. It's the whole lot. Christ is king. Christ rules and reigns now. And everything belongs to him. Amen? You're in Hebrews 1. I want you to turn over to Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5, verse 5. says, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, But was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The author of Hebrews in chapter 5 here is using the Old Testament text. Does it sound familiar to you? You are my son, today I have begotten you. Where does this come from in the Old Testament that the Hebrews author is borrowing it from? It comes from the famous Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? Follow me. Let's come back. Let's see this. Turn to Psalm number 2. Getting some Bible turning practice this morning. Psalm number 2. And this is one of those opportunities that we have to connect the Old and the New Testament together. To see how the author's of the New Testament are constantly drawing from the Old Testament. Psalm 2, why do the nations rage? Why do the people plot in vain? Come down with me to verse 7. It says, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, and here's the warning then, since Jesus is king, since he is risen and ascended, here comes the warning to the kings. Therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, and serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Amen. Amen. So before we get to being us being the heirs of Christ, we have to understand that everything belongs to Jesus. The nations are his heritage. This gospel that is advancing in the world despite the crazy times that we live in. These kings, these leaders, these politicians that rise up shaking the fist against God have a clear warning from scripture. You are not king. Christ is king. You do not own the land. Jesus owns everything. And all will be his. Every enemy of Christ will become his footstool. Christ is the true heir of all things. All is his, created by him and for him. And he inherits all things. So our first big takeaway from from looking at Romans 8, 17, about us being heirs with Christ, is to firstly get the teaching that Jesus himself is the heir of everything. And once we have that right thinking in place, we're going to start to marvel at what Jesus does next. We just stood back, right? Hopefully you've been with me, standing in awe of the fact that that Christ is king, ruler. That all is his, and now he is saying that we are heirs with him. He who owns everything 
He who has everything and everything is to be reconciled to him, we are, his, we are heirs with him. Will you just marvel at that for a moment that God would do such a thing? That he would not only forgive us as rebellious, sinful creatures who time and time again are, are faithless while he remains faithful. We who turn away from him, yet he is always good and faithful. And that by believing upon Jesus, he would justify us by faith. That's what justification by faith means. That you don't work for your salvation, but you believe in Jesus and you receive pardon. You are justified. You are in right standing. That Jesus would do this for us, having believed in his death and resurrection. Not only does he do this, but he adopts us into his family like we saw last week. He graciously gives us his Holy Spirit who indwells us and sanctifies us, changes us. But now Paul starts telling us about what benefits you have as somebody who was a child of God, adopted into his family. And he says, you are an heir with Christ. Come back to the text of, of today, which is, if children, then heirs. You are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I love this verse. If you look at it, you'll see this. Three big statements for us. That we are heirs with Christ, provided we suffer, and then finally, that we will be glorified with him. I love it when Paul makes it easy. He doesn't always. But in this one, he says, here's the three points for your sermon. <laughs> the first one is that we are heirs with Christ. You don't have to turn here, but if you're taking notes, you might want to jot these down. Galatians 4, 6 says, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You are no longer a slave to sin. Sin does not rule over you as it formerly did. It was your master, but now you belong to God. You are a son. And if you are a son, you are also an heir, which means that you have an inheritance waiting for you. Titus 3.7 says... Being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The Bible is very clear. The promise to the believer is clear today, and I hope you hear it. If you are in Christ, if you have turned from your sin, put your faith in Christ and in him alone, you are an heir. And there is an inheritance that awaits you. An inheritance that you will share with Christ himself. He's sharing it with you. Amazing, right? Being an heir is strongly linked now with hope for the believer. Are you a, are you a Christian who, uh, at times in the day and age that we live in, you struggle at times to have hope in this life? Hope for the future. Well, I want you to take from the text that the outworking of being an heir is that you have something in your future that your mind can't even understand yet. So let that raise up the hope in your life. May you be filled with hope today as you consider this. And it's not just hope where you're hoping it might work out. It's a promise of scripture. And he is saying another promise to you this morning that you have an inheritance that awaits you. You have hope now. And it's not just future hope. It's hope now. The, the, the author F.F. F. Bruce comments and he says something of the glory, something of the glory that awaits you is actually already visible. We get glimpses of the glory. We get the visible outworkings. We see things today. We see baptisms. We hear testimonies of changed lives. We come together week by week and enjoy fellowship with the strangest group of people that we would never have come, come together with before, right? God brings people from different cultures, different backgrounds together, and he makes them a family. We have power over sin through the Holy Spirit in our lives. We have visible outworkings and we are seeing heaven breaking into our reality as we continue with God. So there's hope now, but there is future hope as well. And this is that the promises are given today that you have an inheritance that wait, awaits you. There's a, there's a passage from 1 Peter that I'll read that describes this inheritance that awaits you. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, 
According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, an inheritance that is undefiled. It is unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Hallelujah. Did you hear the description of your inheritance? It is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Have you ever had something precious in your life? A, a family heirloom, a, a, a family photo or an antique. Something that was very precious to you. But over, the, over time you've watched it fade. You know that this thing is precious, but you understand also that it could be destroyed by fire. It could be destroyed by water in a, in a flood, for instance. Or it could simply perish with age. Yet what awaits the believer, the inheritance that we have, is eternal like God himself. No perishing, and it cannot be destroyed. And it cannot be taken from you. And friends, this morning as we, as we marvel about these big realities, right... I, th I think it's, it's hard for us to get our finite brains, our finite minds around the, the, the riches that God has. And God's very word would confirm that for us, right? 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, As it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. You haven't imagined it yet. You can try and, and imagine this inheritance that awaits you, but God's saying, you haven't, you haven't even got the thinking there yet. You haven't even got the ability to think on how great this inheritance is that is coming to you. Ephesians 3 says, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. There are unsearchable things of God, unsearchable riches of Christ, and there are things that no eye has seen or heard. Yet while they are unsearchable, God makes known so much through his word, doesn't he? He makes known to us what he is like. He makes known his attributes. He makes known salvation to us. And he makes known his plans and his mission. There is no amount of study in this lifetime where we could arrive at a conclusion that we could say, in this lifetime I now know all there is to know about God, his word and his kingdom. How many lifetimes studying? It'd be endless. Our God is infinite. But we have some description about what this inheritance is like. And I want you to get this point firstly. Because as we talk about inheritance, and if I said uh, in, in very terms of family you had an inheritance, you might think of a set amount of money that you might be inheriting uh, with the passing of a loved one. But one of the most amazing things about the inheritance that we have in Christ is that we have the Lord himself. And we don't want to miss that. We shouldn't think about heaven and our future hope in terms of what we will get. We shouldn't think about heaven as the place where we hope to see the loved ones that we had that have passed on. Although there's hope in those, those realities, right? For those who are in Christ, family members... We, we, we hope to see those people again, right? Or we talk about the riches and the treasures that are being stored up in heaven. But firstly, it shouldn't be that our, our longing for heaven isn't just lost family members and treasures in heaven. It is the Lord himself who we will embrace. The Lord who we sing about week after week. He is our portion. The psalmist says, who have I in heaven but you? I have nothing I desire but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but the Lord is my portion forever. So as we long for our inheritance, we must recognize that Christ himself is our inheritance. And we will finally be with him for all of eternity. He is our inheritance. He has promised us eternity itself with him. Revelation 21.4 speaks of, of what we're inheriting. It's a, a glorious future where there will be no more death, 
No more crying, no more pain. Who's looking forward to that? God also reveals that in this inheritance, there is an aspect of our future where we will be reigning and ruling with Christ. That he will give some of his authority to believers. This is found in Revelation 3.21, 1 Corinthians 6.3. So therefore, being a child of God's, God means that we are heirs with Christ and a glorious inheritance awaits you. Some may feel, though, as we turn to this second point, it takes a bit of a turn around the corner that they're not so keen on. The verse says, if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Now, to hear of this, you might have just been thinking, oh, this is really great. This inheritance, Christ sounds really good. Bring that on eternity, no more pain, suffering. Wait a minute. (laughs) Let's have an honest moment together here this morning. Human beings do not like pain. They do not like suffering. They do not like being uncomfortable. One of the biggest issues that we have with the church in the West, right? Comfortability. We have things in life that we would not describe as enjoyable, and this relates to suffering, yet they are necessary. Because not every part of life, whether you're a believer or a non-believer, is comfortable and smooth sailing. And we just have to be mature and grown in our faith to recognize that suffering is a part of the journey. This is the very reason why we must, as Christians, and particularly pastors, must reject what is known as the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel. This is a teaching of the American church that has then crept into the Australian church and Churches all around the world. Taking people's money and offering false doctrines. Turning the word of God into self-help, get-rich-quick schemes. Turning the Bible into a think-positive book. Turning the Bible into, here's how to live your best life now. Doesn't seem to match up with scripture when we are promised suffering, amen? See, in fact, there's... No mention that we would have such a life of comfort and pleasure. We are rich in joy. We are rich in the things that we get from God. But becoming a millionaire is not one of the promises of God. In fact, what Paul is saying in our text today, whether we like it or not, this is God's word. And he said, if we are an heir with Christ, you will suffer with him. That itself is another promise. And we might say, God, I, don't, I really don't like that promise. I loved all the other promises, but the promise that we will suffer in this life, that one I'm really struggling with. And I just want to encourage you this morning. What happens in life as we study the word of God truthfully is that we come away from wrong thinking over time and line up with God's words. It makes sense to us and it has to make sense that if we have lived a life apart from God, Or if we've lived a life where the Bible's been taught uh, as a self-help type of book to us, it'll take some time for that type of thinking to change in us. We should be clear, Christians are richly blessed in Christ beyond measure. Abundantly blessed in him, right? And there are Christians who will be financially better off than other Christians. God does give a little to some people and he gives a lot to others. And he calls us to be content in our situations. But there is no less joy for you in either of those categories. God blesses his people and he rewards obedient living. But God provides your needs. Doesn't promise your wants, but he provides your needs. And the prosperity, health and wealth gospel is a vile and poisonous teaching that must be rejected. If the church is to be firm and stand firmly upon God's word, we must understand the doctrines of scripture. Just a couple of extra ones to help us as we understand the second Timothy 3.12 says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. Is that you? Is is second Timothy describing you this morning? Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, hear the next three words, will be persecuted. This gets me a little bit worried, right? 
with the, with the times that we live in, with the, the day and the age and, and the, the comfortability of the Western church, well, we don't really suffer at all. Well, we don't have what our brothers and sisters overseas have. They can read that and go, yep, I see this very, very clearly. Philippians 1.29 says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. So it's clear. The promise is clear. God's word can't be skipped over. Suffering is something that we need to understand and recognize as a part of the Christian journey. But I want to tell you this morning, in addition to these promises, are the great promises of God that he himself is doing amazing things in and through the suffering of his people. He always has been and he always will be. See, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison." God uses suffering to prepare you. Right now, there's been something taking place with some of the Australian evangelical leaders. One pastor was attacked by the media for the church's biblical views on abortion and homosexuality. Other evangelical leaders actually came out in light of this situation and gave advice to pastors saying... What you probably need to do now is go back through your online sermons and delete the ones that might get you or your people in trouble. What a disgusting thing to say. What a thing to be rejected when God says that you will suffer for just declaring the truth of Scripture. There is a reason why Christians throughout history were beaten, stoned to death, burnt at the stake, thrown in prison and beheaded... Because they spoke the truth of God and they didn't back down. It wasn't because uh, they were going out to be troublemakers. They just went out with the scriptures and said, this is what it says. And in, in our modern context, we've become so comfortable, we've become so soft on the word of God, that the advice would be given, take down your sermons that speak the truth of God's word. Reject such teaching. Reject such advice. This is academics not fit to be pastors giving advice to shepherds who are to stand firm upon the truth of Scripture. Christians need to stand firm on these teachings, saying things like abortion is murder, abortion is worse than Hitler's genocide, and homosexuality is sin, and those who practice it will have their part in the lake of fire along with the rest of people who reject God and die in their sins. But we don't stop there, because the good news of Christ is that all sinners who repent, all sinners of all sins, of all categories, can be forgiven in Christ. Amen? We speak the whole truth. We don't bring a a, a subtle version. We speak and declare that sinners will die and go to eternal punishment. But we speak all of the truth that sinners who repent and turn to Christ will receive life and eternity and an inheritance. That they will be adopted as God's people. That they will be forgiven in Christ. And it is a glorious gospel to proclaim. Amen. The Christian life involves suffering. Not because we, we go to start trouble, but because we speak truth. And let's be honest, people hate truth. They prefer lies. Jesus spoke truth. And what did they do when Jesus spoke truth? They beat him and they killed him for it. And if we are going to be heirs with Christ, then we should expect that there would be a level of suffering with Christ. But as we consider this this morning, I want you to also consider God's grace and hear from the scriptures. I want you to hear God's kindness, his sovereignty over suffering. That he speaks to us and teaches us that your suffering is never in vain. Your suffering actually has a purpose in your life. God uses suffering in the life of the Christian. Romans 5 says more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Who does that? Paul says we do. He says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. 
Do you want to be a Christian who has endurance? Who's not tossed about by all the waves of deceit and the ways of the world? We want to be Christians of endurance. Paul knows that our sufferings produce endurance and that endurance produces character. And that character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So there is great purpose for us in suffering. God permits suffering because it produces endurance, Christian maturity, sanctification and hope. And this makes very clear, doesn't it, the scripture that says God works all things for good for those who love him, even your suffering. And the promises continue about your suffering that say in 1 Peter 5.10, After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. That he will not leave you in that place for long. And if you say, well, what if I lose my life in my suffering? Well, even in that, death is not the end for you. Just like it was not the end for Christ. The disciples were dismayed. They were thinking that everything had fallen apart when Jesus went to the cross and he died. They thought it was all over, but Jesus rose victorious from the grave. Reigning from heaven now, having ascended. And you, friend, are united to him. You are united to him who rose from the grave, conquering death, conquering sin itself. So even if your suffering leads to death, which it probably won't for any of us, right? It will for some Christians. But we understand that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. People are so scared of death. You get around death and you see the way people without Christ handle death. The great sorrow, the great distress trying to do everything they can do in their lives to prevent death coming to themselves. Yet for the Christian, death is not the end. For you will be then in the presence of Christ. Take heed of the book of Acts, which teaches us that when Christians suffer, when they are afflicted by others, even when they lose their heads or are stoned to death, it never, ever stops the church. It never, ever stops... God's purposes, in fact, it does the exact opposite and it grows and advances the kingdom of God. So here's just a couple of considerations for considering suffering today. The first one is this. Don't be surprised by suffering. Do you ever do that? Something bad happens? You say, how can this be happening to me? You think we'd learn, but we do it again the next time something bad happens. Don't be surprised by suffering. You promised it in scripture. Are we paying attention or not? Don't miss it. Also, don't get confused with suffering that is the result of us just going and making some really dumb decisions. Don't sin and then have to walk out the consequences of your sin and say, look at me suffering for Christ. (laughs) That's not it. That's just going through the results, the consequences of you doing something dumb. All right? Suck it up, walk it out, repent, and continue following Christ. We must also understand that God does allow Satan to inflict us. We see that with Job, right? That God allowed Job to be inflicted by Satan. We saw it with Paul, that Satan does have fiery darts... And it's obviously that he's aiming those fiery darts at believers. But know this, that God in his sovereignty will use those fiery darts and afflictions to do great things in your life. So even Satan, with the level of power and influence he has, is no match for our sovereign and all-powerful God. Satan is no match for the plans and the purposes of God. Satan is but a barking dog on a leash. Now that dog can scare you and get you back on track, right? That dog might even give you a nip if you get too close, but he is on a leash and he is restrained. So we should pray and be guarded, but not obsessed with seeing everything bad happens as an attack from Satan in which to flee from. The better approach 
to suffering and affliction is to grow in Christian maturity, to have trust that God's purposes will prevail. That when we are going through something as difficult as it is, pray a prayer like this. God, help me to see what you are doing in this time of trouble. Don't waste your suffering. Don't waste it by just looking for the, the, the escape from it. That, that means, of course, doesn't mean that we don't pray and ask God to, to deliver from situations. Amen. First and foremost, we pray for healing. We pray for God to, to bring us through tough things. But don't miss what God wants to teach us through trouble, through suffering. Ask that we would have eyes to see God at work in our suffering for his glory and for the good of his people. But as we've considered this this morning, that as we are heirs with Christ, we have a glorious inheritance. But it does mean in the now, there's suffering, there is affliction as a follower of Christ. But this is all leading somewhere. It says, if you are children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And this is where Paul lands this verse. Because being a child of God means that there is a day coming where you will be glorified with him. Talking with some of you, I know the wrestles of life. I know the struggle with sin. I know the things that come upon us, whether it's bad health and health and pain in our bodies and and things that we are going through at the moment. But there is a day coming where you will be, not just in heaven, you will be glorified with Christ. We've been spending a lot of time talking about this sanctification process, haven't we? This wrestle with sin and putting off sin, putting on Christ. And and, and there's times where we are like Paul crying out, Oh, wretched man that I am. Well, What I want you to know from the text today is that there is a day where, Oh, wretched man that I am is not going to be called out anymore. Because you will be glorified with Christ. Glorification is the final stage of your sanctification. That wrestle with sin will be no more. It'll be put off. When we repent of sin, there is a day coming where you will have your last repentance of sin. You will sin for the last time and you will be glorified with him. That day is coming, friend. And I'm not speaking as 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 a prophet or something with extra biblical insight. I'm speaking with one speaking the word of God that says... There is a day that is certain for you. If you are in Christ, glorification with Christ is yours. So we labour in the gospel. We seek holiness and righteousness, but that longing will be no more. You will be glorified with him. And so I just simply hope today that this would fill you with a great hope and encouragement. We're talking about this slow journey of growing and being like Christ progressively, but it's all leading somewhere, friends. Glory with him we will suffer with him for him but don't despair in your trials rejoice in your trials like paul says you will be glorified with him just as we as we go to 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 bring this home today there's many promises in scripture out there that we can just be filled with hope today and and Take these things away. But my concern as we come to a close is that there would still be somebody listening who has not come to the place of surrendering to Christ. Whose future is very different than the one that I've been describing. I've been describing a future of glory, hope, inheritance, promise, blessing. And my, my concern is that there's someone in the room whose future is not that. Whose future is quite the opposite. Whose future is death and destruction And torment for an eternity in hell. If you have not yet called upon the name of Jesus, friend, I plead with you this morning. I urge you to surrender to Christ. For whatever reason brought you here this morning or for whatever reason somebody might be listening to this online. God's plans are that you would hear the gospel proclaimed. That Jesus Christ took on flesh and came to us. That he died a sinner's death in your place. That death could not keep him down. He rose victorious over that sin and death. And he calls you now to turn from your sin and put your trust in him.
I don't want your suffering to be in vain. I want your suffering in life to be bound to the reality that you will be glorified with Christ. So friend, if you are hearing this today, today is a great day for salvation. It is the Lord's Day. The date is the 30th of October 2022. I can't think of a better day for salvation than that date. Today is that day, friend. Come and see me if I can help you in the process of surrendering your life to Christ. Let's pray together.